So good evening, everybody. Brother Don Graham is not here. He left after lunch. He may have left at least some of you in doubt as to who is older. I, I want to set the record straight. He is older. <laughs> light years older. Well, it may not be light years, light months. I'm delighted for the opportunity to be a servant of the Word of God and of the Gospel with you this evening. I'd like to have you turn with me to the letter of Paul to the Romans and uh, chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 beginning at verse 31. Romans 8 and verse 31 reads, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his word and give us help as we look into this passage together this evening. Now, it may be on the mind of at least some of you as to why we would devote time at a conference like this for the preaching of the gospel. After all, this is a conference of the Indian Brethren Fellowship, and uh, this is a good uh, week when Christians come together to be instructed in the Word of God, to enjoy happy fellowship with one another, to appreciate the Lord, and why take the time to particularly devote to the preaching of the gospel. In answer, I would... Uh, bring to your attention something that Charles Spurgeon once said to young men who would uh, gather around him to be trained in preaching. And Spurgeon would say to these young men, young men, whenever you stand up to preach, make sure you preach the gospel. Because the sinners need it and the saints need it. Love it. And if you are a believer tonight, if you've had that happy and joyful event in life when you turned to Christ to receive life from him, it is my prayer that uh, you will be able to bask once more in that vast ocean 
of the love of God. A God who seeks sinners, yearns for them, and longs to bring them back home to his heart and to his fellowship. And if you are one in our midst this evening who has never heard the gospel, or as has been mentioned several times, you've heard it hundreds of thousands of times, it is my prayer that it will not be said of you that you heard the gospel of this great salvation and you neglected it. Not rejected, but you neglected. And that's a real danger because you never know when is the last time that you will get to hear it. Every once in a while, I like to get interested in probabilities. There is an interesting probability, and uh, as far as probabilities go, it cannot get any better than this, and that is that one out of every one of us will die. And one of us is the next one of us to die. So if God speaks to you and he presents his son in all his magnificent glory to you tonight, do not neglect so great a salvation. Some weeks ago, I remember hearing a young missionary brother who serves in one of the African countries. And he said that during lunch, he would get together with other Christians. And as they're having lunch, uh, they would ask one another, Brother, tell me the gospel again, will you? Just tell me the gospel one more time. I love to hear it. And tonight, to my brothers and sisters, that's the joyful task and uh, responsibility I have, is to share with fellow believers the gospel one more time. The hymn writer really got it, didn't, didn't he, when he said, I love to tell the story. For some have never heard the message of salvation from God's holy word. I love to tell the story to those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. I love to tell the story. It will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. There is a real sad and serious possibility for any one of us to move among Christians. And at a place like this, I'm well aware that maybe 99% of the people have grown up, been fortunate enough to grow up in a Christian home where the truths of the gospel were well known. We grew up hearing it. And over time, we acquire the right vocabulary so we can converse in it. And then we see other people doing certain things in response to their own convictions about faith, like getting baptized and getting into uh, the local assemblies or churches and uh, kind of trafficking in Christian things. But never really confronting the reality of their own sinnership and the need, the urgent need to cry out to God for mercy. A good brother I know who travels around and speaks in local churches, both in Canada and um, various part of, parts of America, uh, he was at our assembly for a weekend of meetings and uh, stayed with us, and after 
the last meeting on Sunday, he was spending the night uh, flying on to the UK the next morning, and we were just chatting about one thing or another, and he said he was down at an assembly in one of the states in the U.S. for a weekend of conference ministry. And they too had devoted one meeting for the preaching on the gospel. And the brother preached the gospel, and after the meeting was over, one of the elders of the meeting approached him in the back room. And he said, Brother, I don't know quite how to tell this to you, but uh, the Lord convicted me tonight, and I need to get saved. And he was taken aback a bit. But then seeing the sincerity of his heart, as the man was weeping, hard tears, saying, I need to get saved. And the brother talked to him and led him to the Savior. And the man was humble enough to acknowledge it to the whole assembly and got baptized before the weekend of meetings was over. Maybe you are one such. Having always moved among Christians, knowing all the right words, singing the right words, serving maybe in the local church, but never having set things right with God by responding to the claims of the gospel that Jesus Christ places upon you. You know, I was one such. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a godly home. So ever since I could understand things and I could consolidate memory, I cannot remember a time when I did not know the facts of the gospel. And then when I was around 13 years old, there was a brother who came through who was a high school teacher who also would do some preaching gospel preaching, and uh, our family hosted him. And I can still remember it as though it happened yesterday. The, pre the brother preached from 2 Samuel about David's son Absalom, a rebellious boy who rebelled against his father and he came to a very inglorious end in his life. And word got to David about the death of his son. And he went up into the chamber. And he began to make loud lamentations, heart-rending cry. Absalom, my son, Absalom, Absalom, my son. Would that I had died in your place. Then the brother went on to talk about the fact that David's greater son, his more illustrious son, the Lord Jesus, he does not say, I wish I had given my life for you. But David's greater son, the Lord Jesus, says, I have given my life for you. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And that night, although I had known the facts of the gospel, I was convicted as the rest of the family was sleeping. I could not sleep. And I knew I had to do business with God and personally receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior. And by receiving him, receive eternal life. Tonight, the gospel gives us assurances, many of them 
And when I read from Romans 8, Paul is giving some tremendous assurances. He had been talking about God's amazing plan, things that God had planned, and how he saves people. And those that he saves, he also transforms. And God will bring that work to completion. God has no unfinished projects. <laughs> there are all kinds of unfinished things that we have lying around our houses, right? Unfinished basement and uh, unfinished yard and uh, unfinished all kinds of things. There are even things like unfinished symphonies, you know. But God does not have anything that is unfinished because he has the resources to complete everything he starts. He who began a good work will complete it. And Paul has been talking about that. And the ultimate plan, when it is all done, those who are saved by the grace of God, God's design is that they should be like the Lord Jesus. And now he says, uh, what shall I, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's a tremendous assurance of the gospel tonight. Just think of it, the God of the universe, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who called everything into existence. The God by whom everything now consists. He is for us. Now it is one thing for us to be for God. You know, we, we sing that in Sunday school sometimes with children, you know. Who is on the Lord's side? It is a wonderful thing to be on the Lord's side. But Paul is saying something different. It is not that we are on the Lord's side, but the Lord is for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, if you just let it stand alone and ask the question, who or what can be against us? There are all kinds of things that are against us, aren't they? You know, we, we are like Jacob, you know, as he's lamenting over the death of uh, two of his sons, or at least he thought they had died. And uh, the possibility of losing another one. And uh, he says, all these things are against me. It was not a good day for Jacob. And we can all think of so many things that we can line up. And we would say these are all against us. Maybe it is health. Maybe it is uh, family stuff. There may be all kinds of things that we might look at and say these things are against us. But... For those who have trusted the Lord Jesus, Paul gives his assurance of the gospel, if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, God is not for everybody. Did you know that? In Scripture, there are many places where God actually says this, I am against you. I don't know if you can kind of really think your way into it. We, we are so used to quoting it that we have not considered the reality of the other possibility, that God could be against us, against Assyria and its capital, Nineveh, against Babylon, against Egypt, against Tyre and Sidon, against Edom. And in some places, it is even said that he is against Israel and her false shepherds. Now, it's not, a, it's not a good thing for God to be against you. But tonight, if you have not personally come and personally responded to the gospel and the claims of Jesus Christ, you are in that position with him where God is against you. He's inviting you to come tonight 
so that you can shift position, you can come into his fellowship where the enmity will be gone, where reconciliation could be possible. And so the gospel call is what? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But that invitation will stop. Because the same Lord who now invites people to come will one day say, depart from me. That's the exact opposite of come, isn't it? Now he says, come, then he will say, go, depart. I am against you. Terrible words they are. There is nothing more terrible. There is, if you want to talk about bad news, we think bad news is if you got a B plus on your exam rather than an A. That may be bad news when you go home, but I tell you, that, that is not bad news. Or your doctor may tell you after some biopsy, you know, I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. Maybe temporarily that's going to be bad news. But the real bad news is when God looks at you. And you stand before him. And he says to you, I'm against you. Depart from me. If God is for us, who can be against us? And then in verse 32, he makes another assertion, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Christ is the source of all our blessings tonight. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, Christ is the source of all your blessings. You have nothing apart from him. If you've got him, then you have all that God can give you. He did not spare his own son, says Paul. Now, the language makes you think of Abraham going up to offer his son and God's commendation of Abraham and his faith. And he says, Abraham, you did not withhold your own son. It's the same language. But, of course, in Abraham's situation, his son was spared. But in this situation that Paul is describing God did not spare his own son. His very own son. He only had one son, you know. It's not like he had many of them and he could afford to give one up. He had one son. One son in whom he was so thoroughly and completely pleased. That son he did not spare and gave up, so that in the words of the epistle to the Hebrews, he may bring many sons to glory. It's a good plan, isn't it? The one son he had, he gave. And Paul confidently asserts, when he gave his son with him, he will give everything. He won't hold anything back because he gave the biggest gift. And if he gave the biggest gift, and that's an argument that Paul uses elsewhere in uh, uh, Romans, in chapter 5, for example. Now, the Lord Jesus uses that argument, going from the greater to the lesser, or sometimes the other way around, going from the lesser to the greater. But here, he's going from the greater to the lesser. He, in giving the Son, gave the greatest gift. And all of the other gifts that are needed, he will give. He gave his own son. God, somebody said, God bankrupted 
heaven. For what? It's not exactly a great trade, was it? He bankrupted heaven for the likes of us. And what was our condition? We were ourselves bankrupt, weren't we? We had no way. We had no means. We had no way of providing for ourselves. We could not do enough to make things right with God. We do not have the capacity to hit a reset button when it comes to our relationship with God. We had nothing, nothing in my hands I bring, the songwriter sings. God bankrupted heaven for bankrupt people so that we may come into the riches that we are enjoying in Christ. He did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. Now, there are many people who are reported to have delivered Jesus up in the Gospels. Judas delivered him up. The priests who tried him delivered him up. Pilate delivered him up. But really, who delivered Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, someone said. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy. But the Father for love. So if Paul says he gave up his own son, it is because of his love for us. God, the King James says, commends or More aptly, God demonstrates his love. God puts it on display. See, in the New Testament, when God wants to tell us how much he loves us, more than any other place, the place to which he sends us is the cross. He says, look at the sacrifice that my son offered on the cross, and you will know the depth of my love for you. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He was made sin for us. That's how God demonstrated his love. God cannot tolerate sin. Not even a little bit, because when we think about our sin, we compare it. You know, we don't go shoot up school children. We don't go to shopping centers and wreak wreak havoc. We, We are respectable, and so we compare ourselves and say, I don't do those things, but God doesn't compare us with each other. God compares us with who? with his son. There is the perfect expression of what God accepts. His son, his goodness, his righteousness, his perfections. So God cannot look upon sin, but then Paul says God made him sin for us. He was made a curse for us at the cross. And we sometimes sing it, Christians. Death and the curse was in our cup. O Christ, it was full for thee. But thou hast drained the last dark drop. It is empty now for me. That bitter cup, love drank it up. Left but the love for me. If God is for us, who can be against us? He that did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, he will also freely give us all things. Here is another question that Paul puts. 
who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is not only that God loves, but he also justifies the believing sinner. He declares him right so that we can be accepted. Now we are actually coming into what is a courtroom scene because it's kind of a legal exercise. God is a judge and he justifies sinners. And that is, how, how can a righteous God do that? See, when God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, God provided a way in which a believing sinner can be justified, and God can be just in doing that. It's not that God winked at your sin. Because the cross, if it says nothing else, it says this, that your sin and my sin are serious matter. God did not wink at it. God took it very seriously. But because he was made sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, those who accept his death as our own, there is this amazing transaction that takes place. My sin with all its weight and burden were placed upon him, and his righteousness was credited to my account so that God can remain just and righteous in declaring me a sinner just. As a good brother says, you know, when we get to heaven, God is going to sneak any one of us through the back door. We can come boldly because God has provided what is needed to accept us and he can remain just and righteous. Who will bring a charge? Well, a lot of people can, but Paul's argument is that none of the charges can stand. Because God, the righteous judge, has already justified us. Now, the question tonight that uh, I should ask you is, when it comes to you standing before God, whose righteousness are you trusting? See, you cannot have a bit of your righteousness and a bit of Christ's and combine the two and hope that that's going to be enough. It's either yours or Christ's. But your own righteousness, the word of God states it across the board, your own righteousness is like filthy rags. God cannot accept it. And human history, and we have plenty of record of it in Scripture, is a history that is full of people wanting to make themselves righteous. Have you seen people do that? You know? You just tell somebody, you know, I, I, I think you were wrong in doing that, and all of a sudden... You know, they, they become, def, you know, they become like attorneys. If there are attorneys here, please don't be offended. They're, they're defending themselves. Self-justification. Luke 18 talks about a man with a perverse bend towards self-righteousness. He stands out in public. And he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like these men. And then he goes through a catalog of his virtues. And then there is another man who it says he couldn't even look up. And he smote his chest and he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner that I am. And the Lord said, the second man went home justified. That's our word. 
he went home justified. Now, the first man went home condemned, not because he was a good man. The second man did not go home justified because he was a bad man. But the difference between the first and the second is that the one trusted himself to be just and righteous. He trusted his own works, his own efforts, whereas the second essentially said, I have no claim to righteousness in myself. I have to trust you and you alone to set me right with you. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God justifies. The next question that he puts is in verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Now, if you remember the beginning of chapter 8, it is with that bold assertion that Paul begins chapter 8. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Not those who have done enough, not those who have made passing grade, not those who are decent enough to get in, but now there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. In Christ is our position. In Christ is our blessing. Who is it that condemns? Again, by itself, standing alone, there are all kinds of things that can condemn us. Our conscience, our heart, our neighbors, our spouses, our people in the church, people in society, there are all kinds of people who can condemn. Certainly Satan and all of his allies. But for those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Why? Because it is Christ that died. It is Christ that is risen again. He is at the right hand of God. He makes intercession for us. There are four things that Paul mentions as to why being in Christ protects us from any condemnation. And then one last question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he goes through seven different things, this little list that he has. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. If you think about it, all of them Paul faced. All but the sword as he's writing. And soon the sword would come. And Paul is thinking about these and, uh, you know, those outside of Christ might look at those and say, well, these are things that could separate us from the love of Christ. But for Paul, these are things that drew him closer to Christ and his love. And then in verse 37, he says, in these things we are more than conquerors. We are super conquerors is what actually the text says. We are thoroughly and completely conquerors through him that loved us. And you would expect Paul to say through him that loves us because Christ's love for us is ongoing, isn't it? In the book of Revelation, that's how it's described. Unto him that keeps on loving us and washed us from our sins. Or in John's gospel, it says... And having loved those that are his own, he loved them to the end. It's a continuous love. But here when Paul writes about these things, he says, we are in, in all these things, meaning despite all of these things, even as we are experiencing these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He's really pointing us back to a specific point in time. That point in time when Christ died for us and demonstrated his love in that way. And then he says, and I am persuaded. 
I am and I remain convinced, he says. And he goes through another list. That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's ransacking everything imaginable to establish this point, that the blessing of the gospel is such that when a person is in Christ, he is in Christ forever, and nothing shall ever be able to separate. The word separate is the same word that is used to refer to divorce in Matthew 19. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Nothing shall come between us and the love of Christ. The experiences and the difficulties and the pressures and the sufferings, however real these things are. For one who has trusted himself to Christ and him alone as the object of his confidence for salvation, Paul says, nothing shall separate him from the love of Christ on the one hand and the love of God that is in Christ Jesus on the other. Now how do we know the love of Christ? We know the love of Christ, Paul says in Galatians 2, we are familiar with it. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. And how do we know the love of God? We know the love of God by the fact that he gave his son God so loved the world that he gave his son. Oh, thank God that by the gospel we are brought into these blessed assurances. Now the question is, do you have absolute confidence tonight that God is for you? Do you have absolute confidence that you've heard the gospel and you heard Christ call you? And he said, come, I will give you rest. And there was that time when you turned to him. It's not a struggle. It's not trying to do your best. It's not hoping against God, hope that it is going to be good enough. It is recognizing that God in Christ has done all the work. He has paid all the debt. We sang it earlier tonight, didn't we? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He has suffered all the penalty that was due me. I was the object of God's wrath by nature and by conduct. But he who was the object of his love, the Father made the object of his wrath. That you and I who are objects of his wrath rightly may be made the objects of his love. That is the gospel. He has done all the work. He has paid all the debt. He has suffered all the penalty. He has satisfied all the demands of God and his justice about your sin. Your response, if you have never trusted him, is to agree with God that you are not righteous in yourself. That you come short. That you cannot reset your relationship with God on your own. And in agreeing with God, you turn to him and receive as a gift what he cannot work to achieve. And scripture calls it Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus. Have you trusted him? Back in the book of Genesis, and with this I'm going to close. There is that time when Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac. 
And he goes into this family, and uh, before dinner, he takes time to tell them about his master, Abraham. And Isaac, his son, and all the wealth that Abraham had. And how it is that Abraham gave all of his wealth to Isaac. And there was a young lady by the name of Rebecca who heard all of this. And uh, the family finally asks her, although she had never set eyes on the man, but he, she heard. She heard about everything that Isaac had, all the wealth, all the riches, and the question was put to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will. Tonight, the Holy Spirit of God has presented before you the riches that God wants to give you in Christ. You've never seen him. But there is the witness of Scripture. There is the witness of a brother who got up and shared about the transforming power of the gospel. And the Spirit's question to you is, will you go with this man? Will you take him and him alone as your Savior? There is a a gospel tract about a well-known preacher who was getting ready for bed at night and then he heard a knock at the front door. On answering the door, he found a little girl dressed in rags. She, through the little door that opened up, she said, are you the preacher? He said, I am. Well, won't you come down and get my mother in? The preacher said, my dear, it is hardly proper for me to come to get your mother in. If she is drunk, you should get a policeman to get your mother in. The little girl said, sir, you don't understand. My mother isn't drunk. She's at home dying. And she's afraid to die. She wants to go to heaven, but doesn't know how. I told her I'd find a preacher to get her in. Come quick, sir. She's dying. Will you get my mother in? The preacher could not resist the appeal of the little girl. So he promised her he would come as soon as he got dressed. The little girl led him down the slum district into an old house, up some rickety stairway, along a dark hall, and finally to a dismal room where this poor woman lay dying. And the little girl said, Mother, I've got the preacher for you. He wasn't ready to come at all at first, but he's here. You just tell him what you want. And then you just do what he tells you to do. He'll get you in. Too weary to sit up, the poor woman raised her feeble voice and asked, Can you do anything for a sinner like me? My life has been lived in sin. And now that I'm dying, I feel that I'm going to hell. But I don't want to go there. I want to go to heaven. What can I do now? And looking at her sin-weary face, the preacher thought, what can I tell her? I've been preaching salvation by reformation, and it's too late for this woman to be reformed. I've been preaching salvation by character, but she hasn't any. I know what to do. I'll tell her what my mother used to tell me when I was a little boy. She's dying, and it can't hurt her even if it doesn't do her any good. So bending down, besides this poor woman, the preacher began, my dear woman, God is very gracious. And in his book, the Bible, 
He says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, she exclaimed, does it say that in the Bible? My, that ought to get me in. But sir, my sin, my sin. He was amazed at the way the verses kept rolling in. She said, the Bible also says that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. And she said, all sin? Does it say all sin? Well, that ought to get me in. And the man continued, he said, it says all sin, but it also says, this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well, she said, if the chief got in, I can come. Pray for me, sir. And the preacher bent down and prayed with the poor woman. And just as she was, she came to Jesus who never turned anyone away. And that night she got in. In the process, added the preacher, while she was getting in, I myself got in. We two sinners, the preacher and the poor woman, entered salvation door together that night. Have you entered in? Is it well with your soul tonight? My sin, oh, the bliss of the glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul.